I believe individually that my purpose aligns with the fifth tradition, which is the purpose of any AA group. Groups have only one purpose. I'm paraphrasing. Each group has but one single purpose, and that's to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. One of the riddles uh, in some places in Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and when I say places, I don't mean that, again, in a negative way, but one of the riddles is a lot of people don't know what its message is. If the message of the group isn't clear, even people who claim membership in the group don't know what it is. Sometimes you think that the only thing that the group is responsible for is to have meetings, and that's not the group. The group is a spiritual entity. The group is on call 24-7. The group doesn't restrict its business to the formality of an hour. Group is available, accountable, responsible, and respectable because it's an AA group. Well, hello, friends of Bill W. and other friends. You have landed on Sober Speak. My name is John M. I am an alcoholic, and we are glad you are all here, especially newcomers. Newcomers, that is, both to recovery as a whole and newcomers to this podcast. Sober Speak is a podcast about recovery centered around the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. My job here on Sober Speak is simple. My job is to provide a platform to the amazing stories of recovery all around us. Consider Sober Speak, if you will, your meeting between meetings. Please remember, we do not speak for AA or any 12 step community. We represent only ourselves. We are here to share our experience, strength, and hope with those who wish to come along for the ride. Take what you want and leave the rest at the curb for the trash man to pick up. Hey, everybody. So that was Mr. Jimmy D's voice that you heard at the beginning of this episode today. Uh, This is Jimmy D part two, which is episode number 53. If you did not catch part one of Jimmy D's story, I highly encourage you to go back and to listen to that. Uh, Basically, part one was... Jimmy D before he got sober and part two is going to be Jimmy D after he got sober and uh, we cover a lot of other topics besides that Uh, we talk a lot about Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole so this episode episode number 53 is brought to you by Alan R. Alan R. went to our website soberspeak.com clicked on the donate tab and made a contribution. Thank you so much, Alan R., for your generous contribution. This episode is for you. So before we get into Jimmy D part two, I want to cover some uh, listener feedback. Um, I've gotten a lot of uh, comments, if you will, on Instagram lately and some direct messages. So if you want to reach out to me there, I answer all direct messages and reply to most of the comments if I can. And uh, um, uh, anyway, that is uh, uh, at Sober Speak, all one word, Sober Speak. Uh, Chrissy wrote in on Instagram and Chrissy said, I've been listening for several weeks after I heard you, John and me, share your story on the bubble hour. Connected, connecting on Instagram makes the connection feel so much, so much more personal. The podcasts have been helpful to me as a mom with a full-time job going to meetings is practically impossible. I have experience with AA and I have considered going back but can't find the time at this point. Thank you for the compliment on my family. I complimented her family. There's a very, a very good looking, attractive family that she had on Instagram there. And she says, they mean the world to me, the, the world to me. My little boy is why, as is my own happiness and freedom. You can absolutely share my comments on the podcast. Well, Chrissy, there we are. We have done it. I really appreciate you writing in, and I hope you find it back to meetings pretty soon. They are my, excuse me, they are my lifeblood. Uh, Carla writes in on Instagram. She, She says, just found your podcast, and I'm thankful for having something to listen to while at work. I'm about 
five weeks sober now and counting. So it's probably about six weeks since I got that message. So Carla, congratulations on your, I'm just going to assume maybe you made it six weeks. And by the way, she uh, ends it with some little uh, namaste hands. And uh, well, uh, I am thankful that you're listening to Sober Speak uh, while you are at work. I hope your employer feels the same way. So anyway, thank you for writing in, Miss Carla. Alan writes in from Georgia and he says, John, love your podcast. Great conversations that feed me in the morning as I walk my dog. Thanks for all you do to keep us in the one day at a time, this one day at a time. I truly enjoy your interviews. I recently listened to Alex Z and really liked your insight about quiet people with great stories. I live in Georgia and I have been in recovery since 1999. However, I'm in the process of getting my feet more firmly into it after all of this re-education. Your podcast has been an important part of that for the last six months. My dog appreciates your blessings, smiley face, Alan. And this was absolutely fantastic. Uh, Alan sent me a picture of his very, very cute little dog that he walks in the morning. And uh, I feel very connected to that dog at this point. Give your dog my best, Alan. Um, on social media, uh, Instagram and Facebook, we posted a comment, uh, both me and my wife, my lovely bride. Thank you, um, darling. Uh, we, uh, we asked, what do you have to be thankful for? And, and Emily says, my God, my kids and another 24 hours. My goodness, that pretty much covers it all. Doesn't it, Emily? Uh, Bjorn from Sweden says, I'm grateful. I've got a bed to sleep on. I'm grateful I've got food in the fridge. I'm grateful I've got two beautiful children. I'm grateful I've got a job. That sucks, but it's better than no job at all. <laughs> I'm grateful that I get to sleep late today. Uh, and last but not least, that I am sober. If it wasn't for my sobriety, I would not be in contact with God. And for that, I am extremely grateful. Peace. Thank you so much, Bjorn, from Sweden. I sure do appreciate you writing in and giving us your gratitude list. Um, Matt, uh, he refers to himself as the old school dude said, uh, I'm grateful for my life, my family, my job, and my animals. Thank you so much, Matt, for writing in. And finally, least but not least on listener feedback, Lynn said, I'm grateful for my family and the people that share in my meetings. Can't, that, that is, uh, couldn't agree uh, anymore. I'm grateful, for, I'm grateful for my family also, Lynn, and the people that share in the meetings that I attend. So, uh, one quick program note here, and then I want to read a little something inspirational that I ran across this week uh, in terms of a program note. Uh, for those of you out there in the world who are wondering how to get in touch or wondering how to listen to this and get automatic uh, notifications that you can listen to Sober Speak, we now are on the cutting edge of the interweb, as my friend Tony D says. In other words, you can text us, text the word sober, S O B E R to 31996. So text the word sober to 31996, and we'll give you some instructions on how to listen to the program and how to basically subscribe to it. It's free, but uh, it would just give you uh, some feedback on how to do that and kind of get you going in the right direction. So this week, I was doing some meditation, uh, and uh, by the way, I do that. I do meditation. Oh gosh, it's been a big part of my life now since uh, it's always been a part of my life to some degree, but it's been a much larger part of my life since about May of last year, or May of this year, actually, of uh, 2018, and um, I was doing some meditation just uh, last night, and. Uh, one of the ladies who was leading the meditation in an app I use called Insight Timer, I've talked about it before, she read a poem, 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 uh, she read a poem, and uh, it just absolutely resonated with me, and I wanted to share it with you guys, and the poem is by Sapphire Rose, that is the author, 
And the name of the poem is She Let Go. And I'm going to read this and I'm going to turn you over to Mr. Jimmy D. And it says, She Let Go. She let go. Without a thought or a word, she let go. She let go of the fear. She let go of the judgments. She let go of the confluence of opinions swarming around her head. She let go of the committee of indecision within her. She let go of all the right reasons. Wholly and completely, without hesitation or worry, she just let go. She didn't ask for advice. She didn't read a book on how to let go. She didn't search the scriptures. She just let go. She let go of all the memories that held her back. She let go of all the anxiety that kept her from moving forward. She let go of all the planning and of all the calculations about how to do it just right. She didn't promise to let go. She didn't journal about it. She didn't write the projected date in her day timer. She made no public announcement and put no ad in the newspaper. She didn't check the weather report or read her daily horoscope. She just let go. She didn't analyze whether she should let go. She didn't call her friends to discuss the matter. She didn't do a five-step spiritual mind treatment. She didn't call the prayer line. She didn't utter one word. She just let go. No one was around her when it happened. There was no applause or congratulations. No one thanked her or praised her. No one noticed a thing. Like a leaf falling from a tree, she just let go. There was no effort. There was no struggle. It wasn't good, and it wasn't bad. It was what it was, and it is just that. In the space of letting go, she let it all be. A small smile came over her face. A light breeze blew through her, and the sun and the moon shone forever. Once again, that's called She Just Let Go. So, I've been thinking about the things that I need to let go of this week, and perhaps that I need to let go of even today. I hope that resonated with you, it resonated with me. Can you think of what you need to let go? Now, please enjoy Mr. Jimmy D. Okay, everybody. So we're sitting here with Mr. Jimmy D for part number two. Uh, like I said, this is kind of like a, a series. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself again, Jimmy, to those who may not have heard the your podcast, uh, your episode last time. I am. Uh, I'm Jimmy D. I'm alcoholic, member of Alcoholics Anonymous, sober since August 25th of 1997. So we're glad you're here. So last time... We had a uh, a really good episode. We were talking about several things. We talked about things like uh, your father, your stepfather, um, the death of the the passing of your mom, uh, and we spoke about the the suicide of your stepmom, stepfather. Yeah. Ste- excuse me, stepfather. Yeah. I'm so sorry. And um, then we were talking about your first drunk. At uh, Papa Do? <laughs> yeah, Papagayo. Pa- pa- Papagayo, yeah. Papagayo, place that you know. That's right, Papagayo's down on Northwest Highway, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Yep. Uh, we also spoke about your your full scholarship to uh, SMU, a kind of real nice school here in the <laughs> Dallas area, and about how that lasted for a year, but you kind of got into some, you had some consequences from your Diversions. Drinking. Yeah. <laughs> Diversions. <laughs> yeah, some diversions. That's right. So now we're going to kind of get up to the place to where uh, you're getting sober. So why don't you take it from there and fill us in on your story from that point? So, you know, to, to kind of fast track it, Bill says graduate things got worse. And I think in most alcoholics, the disease of alcoholism progresses. And so, you know, you don't have to be a daily drinker. You don't have to be... Uh, 
uh, any other specific type of drinker. But what I'm realizing is, you know, I'm a guy who gets a sense of ease and comfort just driving to the liquor store. I can relate to that. Yeah. And, uh, and so, you know, I am, uh, I am, I'm separating myself certainly from my family and, uh, you know, my grandmother lives within six or seven miles of me. And when she needs something from me, which isn't very often because she knows she calls on everybody else before she calls on me, Mm. but on the off chance that she needs something, you know, she calls as early as possible on a Saturday morning, six 30 or seven. And, uh, you know, I've got the flu. My nieces are on a cruise. There's a prescription and I really need it. And, uh, you know, I'm hung over, uh, but I know what I owe. And I say, if you just give me 30 minutes, I'll throw on some clothes. I'll pick up that prescription and bring it to you. Meaning because, you know, she sacrificed a large portion of her life. I'm not blood related to her at all. Right. She loves me and I love her. And, uh, and, you know, I'm sick and my stomach's turning over and, you know, I'll know by now that I, I shouldn't make a drink. So I just pour a little vodka in a coffee cup, just to sip on it just a little bit, just so I can get myself together. I can't, she can't see, I mean, she probably hasn't seen me in a year. She can't see me like that. And, uh, and, you know, then I lose all track of time. It's two or three hours later and she calls me again and she said, I know you probably got busy, but I really need that prescription. Then she sweetens the pot, right? She knows what she's dealing with. I'll give you a hundred dollars if you go by and get that prescription and bring it to me. And I said, honey, I'm sorry. I just, I just got sidetracked me, but just give me a little bit of time. I promise I'll be, I'll be there in an hour and I get drunk. So, you know, two or three hours later and that, that particular, you know, day is, is typical of a thousand other days. By the time I get drunk and you call me back in the afternoon, I don't answer your telephone call. And I scream at the answering machine because that old woman's getting in my business. Mm. And all she says on the other end of the line when she leaves that voicemail is, just call me and tell me that you're okay. I don't do that. So, you know, it's not any fun anymore. We're not driving around White Rock Lake anymore. We're not hanging out the hill anymore. You know, we're not walking a check at Pizza Inn anymore. I mean, this is, this is the real deal, and I'm dying of alcoholism. I'm dying of alcoholism. And, uh, and so a, co- a sequence of events is going to start happening. I got another DWI, January of 96. May of 96, I went to probation for the first time on a second DWI. May of 96 to May of 97, I drank as hard as I'd been drinking before I got the DWI. But my, my consequences are much greater. And so right before Memorial Day in 1997, my probation officer, who, by the way, I've kept in touch with through sponsor direction for the past 22 years. That's great. I had lunch with her last week on Tuesday because she just she's retired from the department. Uh, she's really excited that Cruzo won his election because she took his felony cases for years. And so she just got back from a cruise to Greece and she wanted me to see some pictures, right? We have a working relationship. She's helped guys that I sponsor get travel permits, all sorts of things. Wonderful things have happened, but segue, right? At the time she was the Hydra, right? (laughs) I mean, just unbelievable, you know. So she asked me if I was alcoholic, and uh, and that particular day, something interceded on my behalf, and I said, I don't know, and I'd never given that answer before, ever. And so she said, we need to do something about that before the courts do something about that. And so she found me an outpatient treatment facility because I had violations already in my file. I was driving without a license. I didn't have the puffer box on my car. I didn't have any insurance. There were innumerable infractions, and uh, and that you know I was at the end of that rope. So I went to a uh, facility here in Dallas, and uh, owned by a longtime sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and and uh, we're not talking about you know treatment. Uh, we cooperate with treatment as AA members, uh, but the best thing that happened out of the next forty days, uh, where I barely drew a sober, drew a sober breath was that um, I was, uh, we were taken 
or unleashed, as the case may be, uh, <laughs> in my first AA meeting, uh, first you know meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, and uh, and I don't know anything about what happened in the hour. Uh, I, it was some form of a discussion. Uh, but you know, all my sobriety, I've heard a lot of people that have a great deal of respect for talk about pavement time. And in that particular building, what happened was they gathered up just a little bit before six and they escaped just a couple of minutes after seven, regardless of what happened. <laughs> and that's just the way that it was. And 21 years later, for all intents and purposes, except for the fact that it's a lot smaller key in on it's a lot smaller it's probably exactly the same right i got the silver chip which is our part of the world commitment 24 hours of continuous sobriety and i didn't want 24 hours of continuous sobriety but i was told it was my first AA meeting i got the medallion and after the meeting was over because nobody knew whether or not i had any wherewithal or resolve for sobriety they had no idea it was a completely anonymous situation a guy with six months of sobriety approached the new man pavement time name's drew and drew shook my hand and welcomed me to aa mm. six months sobriety mm. seemed like a hundred years and he gave me a telephone number and he tried his best to get mine and he told me if I'd be at the same meeting tomorrow night, he'd be there too. And I left my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. Number one, they didn't change the topic to fit whatever it was that they thought I needed to hear. Number two, I didn't have a meeting directory or a newcomer packet. I didn't have a book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I had a telephone number from a guy who'd been sober for six months, and I got a handshake welcoming, welcoming, welcoming me into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm 21 years sober, and I, to the best of my ability in sobriety, tried to say yes whenever AAs asked me to do anything at all, and I've never repaid the handshake. Mm. It'll never happen. But I'm trying my best to do that. I'm trying my best to do that. So I was introduced to a guy who became my first sponsor. Uh, they sent me off on Thursday nights to a book study. No better or worse AA meeting. That wasn't the scope or purpose of that. They just felt like I needed some exposure to the literature. And they knew that this group was really good about studying the first 164 pages of the book. So a couple of people, one, a guy and his now wife, um, would come by that treatment facility and pick me up at 715 to take me to an eight o'clock meeting at this other group on Thursday. Mm-hmm. And I met this big, tall guy that looks like Larry Bird, and he became my first sponsor in Alcoholics Anonymous. We sat across a picnic table at the church where that group met and meets, and, uh, and he talked to me about AA. And he talked to me about a God of his understanding, which I was not keen on hearing about any of that. Mm. And I said, I don't know whether I can deal with the spiritual part of the program. And he said, there is no spiritual part of the program. That is, that is the program. And I'm going to tell you, I hit my knees in the morning and ask God for a day of sobriety. If I enjoy that day of sobriety, I hit my knees that night and I thank God for that day. And I said, I ought to know all there is to know about hitting your knees to pray. So just real quick, let's, let's back up here a little bit. Uh, right. And so this may segue into that because there are people who come into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous and they hear, you know, the God of their understanding or the spiritual part or whatever the case may be. And they, they struggle with that. Obviously you came in struggling. What was going through your head at the time when you were struggling with praying or, you know, reaching out to a God? Well, in the beginning, in the summer of 97, I didn't do it. I mean, you know, that's the, that's the deal about, you know, whether or not we're in a position, I think that also segues into, I fell in with a group of people who said, if you want what we have, and they weren't finger in the chest people, but they put a lot of arms around your shoulder. And I was brought into Alcoholics Anonymous. They brought me in. And so part of that bringing in was that I was going to be exposed to a spiritual way of living and thinking, not a religious way of living and thinking, but a spiritual way of living and thinking. So much 
depended upon the application of the principles and the steps in all my affairs. They believed in Kitchen AA. Kitchen AA. Which means if your program's not working at home, it's not working. Okay. And that was the most important part of your of, of, of that practical application. Now, that's all, you know, future stuff, right? I'm a guy who's in a treatment center from 4 to 9 o'clock, Monday through Friday, and I'm drinking, right? But I got this, I got a, I got a sponsor who's, you know, active and involved home group member in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he's putting it out there, seeing what I'll pick up and what I won't. Call me every morning at 7 o'clock in the morning. Most days I don't do that. He said, if you can't make a telephone call, you'll never make a searching and fearless moral inventory. Hmm. He just make very simple comparisons. He didn't say it in a hateful tone. He didn't say it in a punishing manner. He just said it, but he said it. So they found me a commitment. You know, the home group that I helped to found almost 16 years ago, we believe in a commitment and taking commitments. And what's that group? Chicago group of Alcoholics Anonymous. Why is it called Chicago group? Because we took our 90 minute meeting format, which is an alien format for Dallas, Texas. Mm -hmm. It's open speaker meeting. First 20 minutes are AA members, only AA members because it's AA meeting, called up to the podium, how's the program working in your life today? Then we have a 10-minute break, and then we have a 45-minute regular lead or speaker, tell your story. So when we were sitting around to form the group in 2003, we had a bunch of different formats, and we had a format that all of us, all seven or eight of us, really agreed upon, and it's a format verbatim from a group that meets in Chicago, Illinois, inside the loop on Wednesday night, seven o'clock. And the name of that group is the California group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Chicago, <laughs> Illinois. Wait a sec. So the name of the group that meets in Chicago is, is the, the California, California group. group, but you took that format and you named it the Chicago group. That's right. <laughs> and so you can go to San Antonio, Texas on Wednesday night, north side of San Antonio, and you can attend the Dallas group of Alcoholics Anonymous <laughs> in San Antonio. <laughs> and they took that format. It's from the exactly Chicago the same group format. In Dallas. No beepers or pagers, exactly the same. <laughs> Not a single word changed. Pagers, that's pagers a little bit and dated. beepers. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> right? But it's Alcoholics Anonymous. It's kind of like North 40 group in Fort Worth. The North 40 group in Fort Worth, I talked at their. I think it was their 38th anniversary this past, you know, I don't know, three or four months ago in the summer. And the North 40 group, the noon meeting of the North 40 group starts at 1145. <laughs> it is the noon meeting of the North 40 group and has been for 30 years. But it starts and everybody knows that it starts at 1145. <laughs> Because this is Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> we ought never be organized. It's the fourth tradition, right? Autonomy. That is autonomy, <laughs> right? True. Doesn't separate from the principles or the the program. So Greg, that first sponsor, got me a commitment. I put the signs out at that church on Thursday night. You know, the signs in the ground that said AA meets here. Mm -hmm. Steps and traditions inside the room for the book study. I drank on Friday and Saturday and Sunday and Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I'd show up sober on Thursday night, 30 minutes before the meeting started, and I'd put those signs out. Now, you lost your sobriety, you lost your commitment. It was a part of the conscience of the group. If you lost your sobriety, just like with a, a job, an elected position in AA, if you're the treasurer of your home group, you're probably not going to be the treasurer if you lose your sobriety. Same concept. So one of the members of the steering committee, there were four or five of them then, they'd come and they'd say, Jimmy, we understand you've lost your sobriety. We're going to need to relieve you of your commitment. Then it'd take them about 10 or 15 seconds, if even. they turn around and they'd give the commitment back. Because I was in a home group and not a meeting house. Mm -hmm. And that sponsor was talking to his fellow AA members. And he said, I don't understand it. And he's struggling but he shows up sober on Thursday and he puts out these signs. That's his only tenuous connection to what we're offering here. And they believed in that. They didn't compromise the conscience of the group. They did not sacrifice the common welfare for my individual well-being. 
You know, Alcoholics Anonymous stayed at the level that it's always been. And what they were doing is trying to bump me up to AA's level. Mm -hmm. And I wanted what they had. And that's what brought me into Alcoholics Anonymous. So you're getting, uh, so now you're getting, so, so obviously at some point it stuck, so to speak, or at least for a while now, up until one day at a time. Right. Since August 25th of 1997. When and can you, what can you attribute to your sticking with Alcoholics Anonymous? Commitment. Commitment. Doing what I say I'm going to do when I say I'm going to do it. In fact, uh, when we were meeting here, you were coming over to the Sober Speak Studios to uh, record this session. And one of the first things that you mentioned before we actually got on the air was um, that this is part of who you are today, your commitment. You say you're going to be here at a particular time and you're there at that particular time. I think about how much Alcoholics Anonymous and, you know, not to, again, leapfrog, you know, into, you know, because what happened is really important. I think what happened is, you know, there's a man that I sponsor and I, and I like the guy, right? I don't necessarily like every man that I've ever sponsored and they probably don't all like me, but I like this guy. And this guy is dying of alcoholism. And so, you know, once again, he's detoxing on Librium Hospital in Arlington yesterday, right? This is like the third or fourth time. And the guy says, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And I said, drunks drink. It's what we do. Drunks drink. It's what we do. But you're going to have to find a spiritual solution. So I hit my knees, and I didn't think my prayers went any higher than the ceiling. But by the time the 25th of August rolled around, Greg had invested a lot of pavement time with me. He'd taken a lot of telephone calls. He'd put his arm around my shoulder innumerable times to give me good counsel. He said, you call that grandmother on Sunday. That was from the beginning of our meeting with one another. He got little bits and pieces of that story, and he knew, he gauged well the reaction of his prospect, one of the things Bill said many years ago. And I called her on Sundays, and I mean, it was short, like a minute 30 maybe, and she was ready to go do something else, and that hurt me. And I'd reach out to him, and I'd say, what do I do? And he said, until she tells you not to call her anymore, you keep calling, you keep calling. Encouragement support, but not in a lamb and bunny kind of way, uh, in a way in which you really knew that there was a foundation there. So their attitudes, ideas, and actions convinced me that they had something going on. And so I was convinced just at the point that I drew my first sober breath, and then I was afraid, what happens next? And so they got, you know, he started to get me in the book. Not in, not some fast track, work the steps in five days kind of deal. I read two pages of the book. We discussed it. I read maybe the same two pages of the book. We discussed it some more. I read the chapter We Agnostics 579 times, <laughs> and we talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. He'd say, when any member of this home group goes to tell their story, you must go, and you come back and you tell me how they got here from there on their own, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So the stories of the sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous and a lot of people who surrendered fighting and kicking and screaming, there were women in my home group that are success that were successfully holding a job and raising their children that should have never been able to keep those children. Mm. You know, there were men who had done things that were ugly things, but they knew that they could turn the past to good account by staying sober in AA and being willing to share that with somebody else if they thought it could make a difference. Mm. And uh, the group was never my higher power, 
but the group was a substantive example about God working in someone's life. All right. So now you're sober. You're working through the steps. Greg is taking you through this. You're getting some experience. Take me on a little farther. So what, what have you learned? Okay, so let, let me phrase the question this way. If you had a billboard that you could rent out <laughs> and money was not an issue and you had one message that you wanted to convey with folks in recovery or thinking about recovery, what would that message be? That meeting is not for you. <laughs> What's that? That meeting is not for you. Help explain that to me. We have so many people, my fellows, our fellows, members of Alcoholics Anonymous, who talk about, I need a meeting. I need to get to the meeting. I've got to get to the meeting. I need to, to hear something in the meeting to change the way that I think or feel. I don't believe Alcoholics Anonymous can handle too much more of that. The purpose of the gathering, per the little bit of airtime that it gets in the first 164 pages of our book, is where we show people that recovery is working. I'm paraphrasing, but we come together so people know that there are numbers and power. Numbers and power. Never says a thing about taking anything away. It talks about giving stuff back from the beginning. From the beginning, it talks about being of service to God and the people about us. It talks about doing something for somebody else. If I had been allowed to continue to be as, as painfully introspective as I was when I came into AA, I would long since have been dead. There was absolutely no benefit for me or anybody else in that. So the meeting is not for you. And I would follow that up with take the new guy to Denny's. <laughs> take the new guy to Denny's. I mean, we do cartwheels and stand on our heads sideways to try to figure out, oh my God, I'm in Mesquite. There's not anything happening over here till six o'clock, but if I drive to Frisco or Greenville or I go down to Cleburne or I go over to wherever, they've got a, a Grand Prairie has a third shift, 4 p.m. discussion meeting. Got to get that new guy to that 4 p.m. bull, bull corn. <laughs> Take the new guy to Denny's where we can eyeball the new guy. Take the new guy to Denny's and buy him a cup of coffee. You can stand to drink a cup of coffee. Allow him to ask you some questions about what in the world you're doing on a daily basis to stay sober. He's never going to do that in any AA meeting, ever. I love it. Okay, just uh, real quick here. I'm going to give a uh, little announcement in the middle of this. We will be continuing... Our conversation, our conversation with Mr. Jimmy D in just a moment. Just a reminder, you are listening to Sober Speak. You can find us at SoberSpeak.com. Uh, there you will find uh, 45 or 50 other episodes you can listen to for free. You can also find the donate button on our website, uh, which you can use if and only if the Spirit moves you to do so. Please keep in mind this is a podcast funded by you the listener. Sober Speak is a self-supporting organization through our own contributions. We are not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution. We do not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorse nor oppose any causes. All right, so now back to Mr. Jimmy. So, Jimmy, I do want to ask you a little bit about, uh, uh, we've talked a bit about this before, about what what do you believe, okay, uh, um, 
what is our purpose, if you will, in Alcoholics Anonymous? I don't always go off on a, a esoteric kind of conversation like this with a lot of folks, but you know, we've had some time here together. Uh, I know you've been around a little bit. You, you've been around quite a bit, and I know you do a ton and a ton of service work, right? You're not going to talk about it, but I know that you work tire, tirelessly within the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and I uh, appreciate your service. So give me your kind of, uh, your overview, your thumbnail sketch of what you believe we are here for in Alcoholics Anonymous. How can we help the new man and woman? I, I believe individually that my purpose aligns with the fifth tradition, which is the purpose of any AA group. And for those not familiar with the fifth tradition, groups have only one purpose. I'm paraphrasing. Right. Each group has but one single purpose, and that's to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. One of the riddles uh, in some places in Alcoholics Anonymous, and, and when I say places, I don't mean that, again, in a negative way, but one of the riddles is a lot of people don't know what its message is. If the message of the group isn't clear, even people who claim membership in the group don't know what it is. Sometimes you think that the only thing that the group is responsible for is to have meetings. And that's not the group. The group is a spiritual entity. The group is on call 24-7. The group doesn't res restrict its business to the formality of an hour. Group is available, accountable, responsible, and respectable because it's an AA group. And individual members, some will align to that purpose and others will not. And for those that will not, they will reap what they, they get what they put in. One of the guys that I sponsor right now, and believe me, I know him intimately, I mean, I've been through inventory with him, and he's a guy who attends a lot of different AA groups. I limit them. I don't let them go every day. He's got five committed meetings a week, which is about as far, that's about as high a number as I could ever, I had three when I got sober. Mm -hmm. Three committed AA meetings a week. So he goes to five meetings a week at f five different AA groups. And he's not allowed to drink a cup of coffee unless he makes the coffee. He needs to make sure that the, there's not a styrofoam cup to be found in the room when the meeting is over. And that's not about service. That's going to keep that guy alive. Mm -hmm. That's about whether or not that guy continues to take. And that's about taking. I mean, we say this is the program that saved our lives. I want to treat Alcoholics Anonymous as such. So we say our common welfare comes first. Personal recovery depends upon a, a unity, unity, right? Tradition one. one. Expand on that one a little bit for me. Is there anything you want to say about that a, a unity? Uh, and you know, this is a, we're getting into a little bit of a dicey well, area because everyone's got a little bit of a different opinion, but with you see, with we you do, and, and, and certainly, and we, and we all do. And, and I appreciate that. But again, because we are Alcoholics Anonymous, even though each group has a certain amount of autonomy, we have, as a fellowship, agreed on some certain things that are rote. The first 164 pages of the book Alcoholics Anonymous describe in great detail our recovery program. The 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, as they are worded, will not be modified by any AA group. We agree to that. The 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous are protected by us in such a way that to change a word in any one of the traditions would require a three-quarters vote for all registered groups around the world, of which there are about 114,000. So the traditions enjoy special protection, whether they're adhered to or not, has nothing to do with that, right? So we've said, okay, the common welfare comes first. What exactly does that mean? 
It means that I didn't stay sober by myself. Alcoholics Anonymous. The program of Alcoholics Anonymous has enabled me to find a God of my understanding that allows me to enjoy 24-hour periods of sobriety. And after I've been introduced to that answer, to that new way of life, it's my responsibility to be willing to share that. So when I'm in a group, 40 or 50 people assembled, where I know that at least 50% of those people have at least 10 years of sobriety in the program, and they ask all who are willing to be sponsors, please raise your hand, and my hand is the only hand that goes up, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And that's not a critique of that group. I think that there has not been enough dialogue about why we're there to begin with. Why we met to begin with. When I go 50 miles from my home to talk about the steps and a guy introduces himself and gets a chip and we give him a newcomer packet and then we turn out the lights and pour off the coffee and we all leave except for me and the only reason I stay is because Drew stayed when I came. Mm -hmm. I don't stay because I'm a good guy. I don't stay because I think I like that guy. (laughs) I stay because they stayed for me. And if I'm 30 or 45 minutes on the pavement with the new man, the new man that belongs to that group, he belongs to that group. And I'm there and I'm taking care of that guy. Something is wrong. And at some fundamental level, we have not grown the leadership or we have not sponsored effectively enough to communicate why we are members of Alcoholics Anonymous to begin with. Mm -hmm. We are not a self-help program. That is not AA's definition. Not even in a loosey-goosey, in the most loosey-goosey definition, we are not self-help people. If Bill Wilson had only thought about Bill Wilson, none of this would have ever happened. Not a single bit of it try so let me uh turn a corner a little bit here and ask you uh uh the kind of questions i don't generally ask a lot of our guests but i i mean i love that you are you're no, and, and i mean this in a positive way well yeah if i'm gonna dig that hole let's yeah. get it make it deep <laughs> no you're you're, <laughs> you're well versed and you know you you've been around and and you you know you can articulate your your uh your thoughts very well. And I appreciate that. So in terms of a role model for you in recovery, uh, obviously if they're, if they're still alive, you don't want to use their last names, but is there anyone in particular or a group of people you can point to that have been role models for you? You've talked about a couple of them already. I think, um, there's a man named Dave from North Carolina, sober, Last September, sober 60 years in the program. How'd you come across him? Uh, I met him through um, some other longtime sober people here that were either connected to him through sponsorship or that knew him from, you know, treks that he had made to Texas many, many years ago. And, uh, and he is just a good old timer, right? And sober, obviously forever but one of the things that i like is the degree of humility which to which he approaches the program what does that look like he stands at the podium and he says don't call me an old timer the old timers were the people that were here when i came Mm -hmm. they're the ones that taught me how to do every single thing that i'm doing (laughs) yeah yeah so there's just something about his uh character and there's something about the way that he carries himself and he's and he's been a leader in alcoholics anonymous knowing though i think and of course many years you know trustee long before our i ever thought about being in aa mm-hmm. uh you know 40 years ago but uh you know he knew uh giants in the program i mean obviously bill was still alive when he got sober he was a delegate in the conference when bill was still alive 
His second sponsor was one of the first hundred members of Alcoholics Anonymous. Wow. Um, and he just treats all that as it's historical information that those people taught him how to be an AA, how to be an AA, right? How to be an AA member. Tom, uh, you know, Tom I, phenomenal example. Mm-hmm. Sharon C., who used to be Sharon B. from Los Angeles, California, one of the finest examples of Alcoholics Anonymous I've ever had the opportunity to know. Peg M. from Bellevue, Nebraska. Dick, who's not alive anymore. Dick, one of the greatest AA members, either one of them, those people who are, um, they're, they're, you know, they're, they know about anonymity in its definition in the 12th tradition, not trying to get all c- complicated about it. The 11th tradition talks about first and last name. Yeah. So, so yeah, okay, this is great. I, and I, I want to kind of geek out a little bit on anonymity because yeah. people get confused about that. Right. Right. So what is anonymity to you? Uh, but, and I'll, I'm interrupted you there, but I no, do want to. No, no, wanna, that's good. So uh, anonymity, as I understand it, and I've tried to read everything that, that we have as far as literature, language of the heart, phenomenal resource for any AA member. All of Bill Wilson, Bill W., right? But he's, well, posthumous anonymity. So all of Bill W.'s writings for the Grapevine Magazine is how Bill communicated with the fellowship. So all of the articles that Bill wrote for the Grapevine Magazine are compiled in a Grapevine book. It's published by the Grapevine called Language of the Heart. A lot of information about AA single purpose, a lot of information about anonymity as it relates certainly to breaking anonymity at the public level. First and last name, press, radio, internet, <laughs> right? Social media, whatever. They didn't have that back then. But, they uh, did not. And Bill, I will tell you, would be taking maximum advantage of technology. You think about it. At the time that we printed the book in 1939, we availed ourselves of cutting-edge technology at the time. <laughs> Otherwise, we would have stuck with the word-of-mouth program. We would have stuck with the word-of-mouth program. Two reasons to print the book. Well, actually, three. Two good and one bad. We wanted to make sure we codified the program, that we didn't have people going out on some limb telling you that you had to surrender to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior in order to come into AA. (laughs) That's not a tradition (laughs) thing. That's a 664-page thing. Right. Right? We wanted a conscience, a group conscience of the 70-odd people that were sober in 39 when the book was actually printed. Mm -hmm. We wanted to make sure that we were able to use technology to carry the message where AA members did not yet exist. And we knew that a book could do that because we could send the book anywhere. You know, a little piece of trivia, one of the things that Little Rock, Arkansas is most proud of is it may be the only place, it is certainly one of only three or four places where Alcoholics Anonymous started with just the book. In other words, the book was sent to a drinking drunk. The drinking drunk got sober on his own through the book, and AA started. Not an AA member was on a train who went to Philadelphia or went to Houston All the other centers, if we want to call cities centers, all the other centers certainly used the book, but a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous went there in short order. Dallas AA started because we had had a meeting here. We'd had some, a little bit of activity, and it failed, came and went. When Esther Elizardi came up from Houston, Bill sponsored her, but she was a sober AA member with the book. Not the opposite direction, right? So Little Rock's really, they, and they're also proud of that Little Rock approach, and that could be a completely different discussion, the <laughs> Little Rock approach. Right. Which was, they qualified you before you could come into AA. Okay, so back to anonymity. Back to anonymity. So first and last name at the public level, but the 12th tradition, the 12th tradition speaks to anonymity by Bill's definition, spiritual humility which means we don't care what you do in the outside world. We're not concerned with that you're a captain of in- industry or, you know, sleeping in the cemetery. When you come into Alcoholics Anonymous, everybody's on an equal and level playing field. 
There's no most important person in the room. Mm -hmm. it, the, the most important person doesn't exist. We're all the most important people. So anonymous service, and oftentimes we call it service. You know, making a pot of coffee in your home group isn't service. It's being an AA member. Hmm. Showing up 15 minutes before the meeting because you're going to chair the meeting and bringing a topic is not service. It's being responsible to your home group. It's understanding what trusted servant really means. Asking somebody to read how it works. When I was first asked to read how it works, I had six months of sobriety. Saturday night, open speaker meeting. They called it the showcase meeting. Not because of the way people dressed or because of how good they looked, but because it was our only open AA meeting. And they said the open AA meeting needs to be more about Alcoholics Anonymous than the closed meeting ever thought about being. Because anybody can come to the open AA meeting. And they're going to learn more about Alcoholics Anonymous in the hour than they ever would from anywhere else or anybody else because we're AA members. And we're responsible for communicating our message. That's right. So when they asked me to read, I went to my sponsor at the break. We had a break then, different format, but we had a break. The reason for the break wasn't because we needed a rest. It was so we could greet people that we didn't get by greeters at the front door when they came, right, when they first showed up. And I said, Jennifer's asked me to read how it works. And his eyes sparkled. And he said, what an honor to serve your home group. So when I went on the floor of the General Service Conference in 2009 as the Panel 59 delegate for this area, you know, you walk in the room after you get to the hotel just to get a feel for the room, and people say, okay, now I'm one of 93 people from the United States and Canada that are part of the group conscience of Alcoholics Anonymous. We are the group conscience for the next two years for all of AA. Wow. And I remembered Greg looking at me and saying, what an honor to serve your home group. What an honor to serve your home group. Lovely. So let me throw another kind of question at you here. Uh, when you feel overwhelmed, okay, when you feel like the wolves are at your uh, door, if you will, what's that saying? The wolves are at your, uh, anyway, the, the, everything is collapsing in on you. How do you use the principles of recovery to navigate those situations. The book says God either is or he isn't. What was our choice to be? My sponsor talks a lot about waiting for the other shoe to drop. And at some point he said in his sobriety, long time into sobriety, 20 years, maybe 25 years of sobriety, long time into his sobriety, behind door number one, door number two, or door number three, none of the answers to the situation were good. They were bad, worse, worst. And finally, after he had spent who knows how many hours burning up all that energy, trying to figure out how he could find a way out, he hit his knees and he said, God, just please bring the answer. Whatever the answer happens to be, let's just have the answer. Because the struggle is killing me. Now, I'm not always there. Sometimes I need help getting there. And sponsorship helps you get there. Because the sponsor's not emotionally involved in whatever it is that I'm messing with. Whether it be personal relationships or something that's going on in my in my professional life or or any you know, any of those things. Uh what does the book say? We're burning up we're burning up energy, right? Foolishly. Foolishly right? And uh, and I do, right? Um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not very good at that part. Oftentimes, um, what happens is, and I would call it a coincidence way back in the day, but I won't anymore is, uh, more often than not, if I stay involved, in other words, I make myself available to, uh, both sponsor and be a, 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 an understanding closed mouth friend, closed mouth being key, <laughs> right? Being available, not so you can shop your topic but so I can be a person who can listen, you know, that I can look you square in the eyes and I can listen and care about what you're talking to me about, 
And if I do that, I, I have no problems. Mm -hmm. I don't have any problems. You know, I know you, and I can tell you that there's always some degree of um, anticipation, even in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, when I come to approach something that I have not done before, I'm just like the new guy, right? I'm 21 years in the deal. It's not like I'm coming into a stranger's environment, but it's just like going to a group, right? Going into a, a group that I haven't been in before. And, uh, and, you know, what you learn to do is, you know, used to be, I would, uh, I'd get upset. I'd be angry. I'd be afraid. I'd do whatever it was I was supposed to do, get in the car, call my sponsor and tell him about how angry I was because they were so disinterested. And he said, next time you go, you need to make sure you shake everybody's hand and give me the names of two men in that group that you did not know. Mm. Once I start doing stuff like that, it all peels away from me. What are you most excited about within recovery and Alcoholics Anonymous at this time? We've talked about kind of some of the, I guess, challenges, so to speak. When we, I mean, talk about the hope that you have or the things that you're most excited about that you see in AA right now. I'm excited about the fact that it, 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 it appears to me that we are more interested in knowing more about what we belong to as a society of people that I think that, you know, again, David used to say, AA is self-cleaning. There's a timeline to that, right? And, and, and when I say self-cleaning, that doesn't necessarily mean that anyone or anything is eliminated. But I think we've been through the block of years, which is kind of a, a, akin to our original flying blind time. We're, we're, we're at a point where there are a lot of groups in our city that have stood on the shoulders of their last old timer. They didn't really know that that's what they'd been doing all along, mm -hmm. but they have been. And so now they're actually in a position where they realize that they need to grow some leadership or the group will not survive. Doesn't matter how many heads are in the room, the group will not survive. It's not a material support issue at all. It's about how spiritually motivated we are to continue to do the things that were done in order for us to have a seat. A lot of sacrifices were made. I'm not talking about anything inconvenient or anything that people can't rally around and be excited about. I mean, I've, I've done the harbinger of doom, chicken little, the sky is falling, <laughs> AA deal. I've been there, done that. It's not attractive for me, and it certainly was not attractive in any way with anyone else. I believe Alcoholics Anonymous stays Alcoholics Anonymous until at which point God deems that Alcoholics Anonymous is no longer necessary. But Bill was correct 65 years ago when he said if anything is going to drastically impact Alcoholics Anonymous— it will only come from within Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. I think we finally figured out that certainly people come to AA with a myriad of problems qualifying for umpteen different anonymi. We get it. But we realize that if we don't try to minister to the individual's alcoholism, that person dies in AA. It happens all the time. And I think we finally care enough about what we belong to to understand that we do whatever we can as it relates to that person's alcoholism and then avail ourselves of the experiences of others that have their own single purpose and help the guy get the help that he needs. AA is stronger. The other fellowship is stronger. It's a win-win situation. And it's not about screaming at the top of our lungs you don't belong in a closed AA meeting. Here's the deal. Every meeting is an AA meeting. Forget about open, closed, men, women, lawyers, doctors, older, younger, any of that brand. None of that matters. Every meeting is a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, there's a Jack Alexander article. Lots and lots of AA members have never been exposed to Jack's article. 
And actually that not knowing is kind of a cool deal, right? Because we talk about Jack because Jack was going to be like the podcast of his day. Saturday Evening Post, right? Right, right? Podcast of his day talking about technology. You know, where the book had been in print for almost two years, they went to the mailbox in New York and they heard crickets. Nobody wanted our book. <laughs> nobody wanted our book because nobody knew about it. Nobody knew. So people talk about Jack like we want to put up some big monolith. Right. And for people who don't know about Jack Alexander, he was, there was what, 1941? So it's a couple of years after the book had been published, he right. published an article in Saturday Evening, Evening Post. Post. And uh, so anyway, I just wanted to get yeah. people up to speed. So, you know, we're, I've been on, on now probably as long as I can be on. But if you've not had opportunity to look at it, whether or not you're a member of AA, AA.org, you can go to the link for members. You can read the Jack Alexander article. It's a, it's a, it's a pamphlet for us. But here's the deal. Jack was an investigative reporter. Jack was a reporter who came to blow the lid off of the fraud that he knew Alcoholics Anonymous to be. There was no way in the world that one alcoholic sharing experience, strength, and hope with another alcoholic was anything other than a ruse, a scheme, and he came to figure out what in the world we were doing so he could expose it. That's why he approached AA. Now, here's the deal. He was the Mike Wallace of his day. He was the Mike Wallace, the 60 minutes of his day. So when he came to Alcoholics Anonymous, as small as we were then, all he did was he came to AA meetings. There wasn't anything as open and closed. All we had were speaker meetings, thank God. All we had were lead meetings. Maybe you talked for 30 or 40 minutes, then they had a little bit of discussion afterwards. That was just all we did. And then we met, you know, we had time in the room, go figure, before the meeting started where we collected with one another and talked and caucused and whatever. And then after the meeting was over, we had donuts or coffee or cookies or whatever, and we hung out with each other. So the meeting from start to finish might have been two hours long. Oh, my God. Right? Katie, bar the door. <laughs> right? Where you had a little speaking in the middle. Okay. So Jack came to the meeting. And he asked us a little bit about our stories, and he heard whoever's story was presented from behind the podium, and then he went back and he wrote his article. And his article is one of the finest pieces of public information ever produced about Alcoholics Anonymous. So what I do in my own home group, I read the article maybe when I had three years sobriety. So off and on for the last 18 years, a lot of times before our meeting starts on Wednesday night, we meet once a week on Wednesday night. Before the meeting starts on Wednesday night, I hang out over by the coffee bar 15 or 20 minutes before the meeting, just kind of listen a little bit to what people are talking about. I certainly sit in the meeting with whomever we have invited and listen to their story, close my eyes for a couple minutes, think about that. I pay attention to what we say when 60 or 70 of us go out to dinner together on Wednesday night after the meeting is over. I listen to the conversations as they occur around the table at El Phoenix or the Burger Joint or wherever it is that we find ourselves. And the whole point of that is this. If Jack Alexander came to my home group last Wednesday night and he went home to write, what would Jack write? Mm. And sometimes... I don't know if it would be anything that would have blown the lid off AA the way that Jack's article blew the lid off AA. Mm -hmm. And that's an anonymous responsibility. It's an anonymous responsibility. We are told, per our literature, that we have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And I believe our department ought to shout that we have an answer. And it needs to shout before we ever go in the building, while we're in the building, and after we leave the building, that's really, really important. Very nice. So I'm going to end it up on a kind of a lighter uh, question here. <laughs> What's on your playlist these days? What kind of music do you listen to, yeah. Jimmy D? So I, um, I listen to some old country. Like, you know, I drove to Austin the last couple of days for work. So I Roadhouse, you know, I listen to Roadhouse. 
Oh, yeah, the uh, Sirius XM. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I didn't think I'd care about Sirius Radio until I got Sirius Radio, right? <laughs> right. Um, and I like some, like, I like Beth Hart. You know Beth Hart? I don't. Dude. Phenomenal voice, right? So she's kind of a jazzy blues, has a really kind of a hard story. She started to get really famous about 25 years ago. I mean, on the cusp. She's like a, a Ann Wilson voice you know like heart yeah yeah right? right just powerful powerful and when she started getting famous she's one of us and her life unraveled i mean her career was skyrocketing but her personal life was unraveling and so she she had good counsel and she was pushed back so to speak and so now she's like a little like i went to Carrollton last year to hear a place that might be held 150 people right she just does like a nightclub circuit kind of deal, and she wants to make her music, uh, right? That kind of person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I like the mu- I mean, I'm a child of the 80s, right? So I still love, you know, I'm a Head East and Cars and <laughs> right. Van Halen. And yeah. <laughs> my first concert was uh, The Police. Ah, yeah. Yeah, Pat Benatar. And, but I like like Asteroid Galaxy Tour, which is kind of this oddball it would almost have been like ABBA back in our yeah, day. Yeah. Um, they didn't take off like ABBA, right? But there's this little sweet. They're Swedish, right? There's. I mean, I find this random. You know, like I'll go off on these tangents. I get in what I call the the Wikipedia hole or the YouTube hole. So, like maybe my mother, my mother loved Dusty Springfield. Right, she loved Dusty. Springfield. Man, now I remember the name, but I can't. What from the '60s? Okay, right. Oh, okay. Um, and so you know, I'll I'll like add something to iTunes playlist, you know, Dusty Springfield. And so then when I fall into that, you know, now with all the technology we've got, you can immediately follow those threads, and you can get into you know somebody that's current day who right. cites her as a person that you know they they emulated or they listened to so you know what's happened now and i know we got to wrap you're this fine. up you're fine it, generationally because i'll be 54 here in a couple of weeks right so you know when i was up and until i was 30 i told you band and then song right now i know the song but i have sometimes no idea about the band. You know what I mean? Like, I have no, I mean, I just have no idea. I just know what I like, right? <laughs> That's so, right. Yeah. Man, I really have enjoyed our time together. Both both of these episodes. Both sessions. Yes, yes. Um, and it takes fact, a village. Yeah, yeah, it does take a village. <laughs> Maybe we'll give it a, a little break and get back again at some point in the future. But I, I really, I appreciate you coming by the Sober Speak studio. Nice. Thank you. To spend some time with me. God bless you. And uh, if anybody wants to get in touch with Jimmy, uh, feel more than um, uh, email me at feedback at soberspeak.com. And um, I'm going to wrap it up here with page 164 of the big book. It says, abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit. And you will surely meet some of us, hopefully me and Jimmy at Mm. some point, as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. See you next week.